Well, it looks like nobody else is going to come. Huh. Yes, nice. Interesting. Well, um, I do have a couple of things, and since we'll you know, make this an official meeting and then we can put it, put it up on the web. So uh, we'll, we'll start the meeting now. Uh, this is a very, very small Wayside like Cleanup office hours on Christmas Eve morning. Uh, so thank you both for coming. Uh, a couple of things. One, um, following up, I listened to the, the, and watched the parts of the meeting last week that I missed because I was uh, trying to balance two meetings at once. Uh, and uh, so I want to share a couple couple things that you guys talked about uh, and just follow up on it. Uh, the first, uh, of course, uh, you spent a lot of time discussing the correct spelling of Hanukkah. And I <laughs> wanted to reinforce uh, apparently that as I think, I think Larry or perhaps you, Joel, had said basically you can spell it any way you feel like. Uh, and I'd like the, in addition, there are more than 20 other variations recorded <laughs> because of transliteration. So, so it does seem to be um, you know, yeah. a wide variety, a, a lot of options there. Right. Uh, the other kind of more serious um, or more work related, I should, should say, let's go to this screen again. Uh, go back. Uh, there was talk of uh, the LSP investigator in that position, and I did kind of look around for that. And there's certainly nothing posted right now, uh, but some of these last for a long time up on the, the, the website. Uh, so it, you know, I, I would confirm what I think what Liz had said, or uh, and Wendy that it was most likely the LSP board has had postings for. To hire an investigator, and I'm not sure exactly where they are in um, interviewing and hiring for that, but that has been a priority for, for a while to, to bring somebody on in that position. And I know um, this fall there was a position out there uh, posted, and uh, I, I received uh, calls about it. Um, so, so yeah, it, it wasn't DEP, it was the LSP board. DEP does not have a position called LSP investigator. Uh, just, just in case you were wondering. But uh, I did want to point out, uh, and this is, this is important and new and fun, uh, we have as part of our discussions internally about what we can do to broaden diversity and kind of bring in general, and, and more importantly, bring younger uh, people in uh, to the to DEP to state service. Uh, one of the things that was identified is that we, while we do have internships, it's often difficult for um, people to take part in internships um, if they're unpaid. Um, and what would help bring on a more diverse group would be if we were able to offer at least some form of stipend uh, to to make taking kind of the time off. Uh, from school and doing the internship uh, a worthwhile uh, endeavor and something that you, you don't need a certain amount of privilege to do. So you may notice on currently posted as of December 23rd, uh, there are a number of paid student internships uh, for Mass DEP. We're very excited about this. And we're uh, looking forward to um, bringing on a, a number of people in a paid position for this. So if you know of anybody uh, who is in school, uh, both uh, undergraduate and graduate school, there's kind of a, uh, a couple of different levels there um, that uh, this might be an option for them. So please spread it around. Uh, all, all three of you spread it around as much as you can let other people know about it. Uh, and I did want to get this on, um, on film so people watching later will be able to, to see that. So that was really cool. Um, the next thing I wanted to bring up, uh, which I, I posted on LinkedIn and then uh, somebody had forwarded to me, um, uh, Marilyn Wade had forwarded as well. It's uh, new guidance that's out for public comment from, from EPA. 
Oh, let's get rid of that. Uh, interim guidance on the destruction and disposal of PFAS compounds. Um, it's now available for public comment. Uh, if you, I'll, I'll put a link uh, on the notes below the, the YouTube video here, but if you just Google, you know, EPA regulations, interim guidance, destruction, PFAS, something like that, uh, you'll probably find it. Um, so this is a screenshot of the uh, the docket at regulations.gov. You could go to regulations.gov and probably- You're not seeing it, Paul. Oh, you're not, oops. Uh, I have to follow through and push the share button. There you go. Thank you. Uh, if you go to regulations.gov, and search for PFAS, uh, that's probably an easy way of finding it as well. Uh, there's the, the document here, which if you click, will bring up um, the document, 107 pages. Uh, it was posted last week. Uh, so it goes, it, it's, um, you know, it's interim guidance, uh, interestingly, um, kind of reading the, what are the things that they recommend as uh, one of the, the options is to uh, put it in a safe place and hold it there until we figure out better ways of dealing with it. Uh, <laughs> to, um, to paraphrase uh, that uh, just containing it for the time being, if that's a possibility, uh, might be uh, one option and then they go through various thermal treatments and landfilling, and you know, there are different options depending whether it's solid or liquid phase, that sort of thing. So uh, comments are, when comment period closes, oh, that can't. Comment now, uh, due February 22nd, 2021, uh, that says now. So we have about, about two months. There it is to to comment on that. So I would uh, encourage people taking a look um, what EPA is recommending, uh, and it may be some uh, you know some options for those of you who are you know dealing with PFAS and particularly PFAS in soil. Uh, kind of what the options are for for getting rid of it. Uh, interestingly, we are uh, there's a proposal that DEP is currently looking at now for a pilot project that, that was discussed at the UMass Soils Conference. Um, kind of, I guess, the lab bench testing uh, that was done for a an approach to uh, soil washing with kind of proprietary uh, mixture of materials and then recovering the. Uh, you know, having groundwater extraction well, pumping the material out, treating it, uh, concentrating it, then treating the concentrated PFAS with UV light to destroy it, running it through GAC as polishing, and then um, re-injecting the, the water back into the ground. Uh, so we're looking and hopefully we'll have a, a pilot, uh, have an opportunity uh, for the proponents to conduct a, a larger a field pilot test of that technology. So there's a lot going on with PFAS, uh, a lot of questions about um, particularly what to do with contaminated soil. Uh, obviously, we're spending a lot of time dealing with contaminated drinking water supplies, where at least the treatment of that is relatively straightforward, if not cheap, uh, where granulated activated carbon uh, will work. But uh, dealing with the source itself and having options other than dig it up, uh, and confine it somewhere um, because even even bringing it to a landfill is potentially pro problematic as the PFAS uh, you know, people have hypothesized kind of cycle through the landfill leachate which goes to wastewater treatment systems and then you know it's just into the biosolids which then you put on the landfill uh, and which then leaches and, um, so having a permanent destructive technologies uh, to address PFAS would be would be very helpful. So again, comments by February 22nd to EPA on regulations.gov. Uh, uh, jobs, PFAS, uh, correct spelling of Hanukkah. Um, one last follow-up from, from last week. I had promised uh, on the less formal version of it, but I'm going to post it, talk about it here. Uh, I, we had talked a bit about my new heated bird bath 
and there was a video that Liz wanted me to share of this fox oh my God. coming and taking a drink out of the new heated bird bath. <laughs> and that was just adorable. Considering that I have a hound dog, uh, not a fox hound this time, but uh, a plot hound uh, who would go absolutely bonkers if she saw that. Um, it's, it's pretty gutsy of the fox. To what time to was it that during the day or night? That was night. That was uh, night. It has infrared lights. Um, this was, I think I mentioned before, I, not, not only did I buy the heated um, bird sauna there, but um, I, I bought some security cameras, uh, bolted them onto a, a pole stuck in a block of concrete that I happened to have lying around. And, and that's out there, um, trained on both the bird feeder and the bird bath. Uh, and since the, the storm happened, uh, nothing you know, interesting has happened out there except uh, the, the normal birds going back and forth, but they have enjoyed the bird bath during uh, the snow cover. Uh, so that's all the detailed things I have on my list. Um, we are going to take off next week. Uh, I'm taking the entire week off, more or less. Um, so we won't have this next week. On January 7th, we also have to skip it because I want to bring this up as well uh, as a plug. Uh, one last sharing of the screen here. Uh, on January 7th, Thursday, uh, Mass DEP will be participating in a EBC webinar. Uh, it's the annual DEP headquarters leadership team with keynote speaker, uh, Commissioner Martin Suberg. Uh, so that's where I will be. Uh, as with all of the other senior DEP staff, uh, we do this uh, every year, uh, event with uh, the Environmental Business Council of Massachusetts. Uh, the commissioner gives a, a talk and then um, there's updates from all of the various DEP assistant commissioners and uh, office heads. Uh, and then a what is the most fun part of it, a about an hour of panel discussion, question and answer from the crowd. So uh, all of you live here present, Joel, Linda, Randy, are uh, certainly uh, if you're interested, that's available. And uh, if anybody watching this live, that's where we'll be on January 7th. So we'll be back here on January 14th uh, to do office hours. So with so with that, that's, I'll turn it over to you. Do you guys have any any questions, any comments? Can, can you uh, email us that, uh, that agenda? The, the EBC thing, sure. Yeah, I, I think it's on the EBC website. Okay. Is it? All right, I wasn't sure if it was there yet. Okay. Yeah, uh, if if the agenda, I mean, that was the draft agenda. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing every year. Uh, okay. I just meant I was going to distribute yeah. it to my office, but uh, if it's on there, if it's on there, I'll just send them a link. Yeah, it's probably there. Um, uh, that we we just got that as a reminder from our chief of staff, uh, reminding us to prepare a few few slides to. Uh, to do it and reminding us that you know, it should be on our calendars. Um, hey, yeah, Elliot. It is there. Yeah. Uh, Elliot, you're muted. Uh, you're... Here we go. Good morning. Good morning. You're late late to the game. Uh, yes. we're, we're just finishing. I slept in. <laughs> oh, good for you. Uh, yeah, my, my, my hound dog will not let me sleep in. Uh, she's up at about quarter of six. Uh, every morning, regardless. Uh, so it's always good to get out early in the morning. Uh, so we were at the point in the agenda where we will take questions from the crowd. So Small crowd, crowd today. No crowd. <laughs> or anything, anything you want to discuss, or uh, you're interested in anything from the news uh, that you've seen. Uh, I did on my LinkedIn uh, page, I did post a link to what I thought was an interesting story on Marketplace, on uh, public radio, uh, that talked about uh, insurance, 
products that are being developed to ensure natural resources. Uh, and it wasn't quite clear from interesting uh, from the article who gets paid out of yeah, yeah. Uh, but so it, it raised some questions. But the, the whole concept of you know, insurance driving changes in behavior you know, is not new. Uh, and, you know, and insurance companies are very good at putting price, a price on you know, the damages that might happen and the, the price to human activities and human folly, if you will. So is this, this is insurance against natural resource damages? Uh, yes, in, in the broad sense, not the way that we use NRD, but uh, the, the case in point was this company had, uh, had an insurance, have developed an insurance policy, and I guess it's in effect, and they may have paid out some already, uh, to insure a coral reef uh, in, in Mexico. Hmm. And, and part of kind of what went into the calculation of, of it was not, not just you know, it wasn't the damage to the reef itself and that, oh, that's bad, but kind of looking at kind of what uh, role does that reef play both in the, the environment and in the econ local economy. So they were able to monetize or, or quantify, I guess, uh, Interesting. The, you know, so what certain amounts of damage to the reef would have on both the local environment, which then impacts tourism, uh, erosion on the beach, the effect that that will have on the hotels and things like that. So that um, you begin to put the environmental damage um, kind of in, in terms that some people are more comfortable in dealing with that. Uh, and we often talk about the, the, that it is you know, cheaper to deal with things now than it is later, uh, but that that is running right up against the uh, tendency, the human nature of putting things off uh, until later and, and taking that risk. And the insurance industry is kind of one way of kind of dealing with those future risks in a way that uh, the American public and American uh, uh, businesses and the American government kind of all kind of understand a bit better. Uh, so I thought it was really interesting. It's, it's worth a listen. Uh, it, it sounds well, incon. Go ahead. Go ahead, Randy. Yeah. So who I guess is the intended buyer of the insurance? Would it be a government agency or? Well, that it wasn't quite clear from the the article. Uh, so I would I rather than me trying to now remember. <laughs> it was a couple of days ago. So. Yeah. Sounds like an ecotourism type policy. I, I, I think it incorporates a little bit of that, but it's it's less ecotourism. It's I, I think part of it was just regulatorism uh, on the beach that the the uh, the coral reef protects the beach from erosion, and if you know, if it dies, if it's damaged, and you have erosion, you know, forget the eco part of it it will have direct consequences on the usual tourist industry. Uh, and you can- yeah, yeah, we can't get Massachusetts to approve a good <laughs> heating oil <laughs> bill. Well, but if you, if the, this kind of circumvents the, kind of the legislative process and, and, and all of the ability for you know, government and, and you know, citizenry as a whole to act get together and act in a directed fashion. You know, it's the insurance industry saying, look, you're, you're people, if they didn't have this insurance policy and in which then would hopefully help people uh, justify taking measures to uh, protect, in this case, the coral reef, uh, the, the insurance industry is going to pay out on the back end even more when there's damage to the beach and the hotels and, and all of that. So it's a way of focusing people proactive. perhaps yeah. on proactive steps, yeah. at the real point of the problem, rather than just reacting and paying out on the effects of the problem. So Interesting. I, I think it's, it's one of those things that, you know, you would hope that logic and re reason and belief in science and kind of following where the science 
brings us would lead us to make correct decisions for environmental protection and the future of the world and all of that. But that's, you know, that's not always the way that it works. And, it, but if you go back to the other, you know, I forget what movie it comes from, but the, the whole follow the money thing, <laughs> you know, rather than following silent science, Deep, that was uh... difficult for us. Following the money seems to be a lot easier. And if that can be used and directed in a way that will result in good environmental protection, then you know, let's use that tool. Right. Where was follow the money from? All the president's men. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> and then just about every movie that came right. after that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then the Mueller report, but he didn't follow yeah. the money. Yeah, well. <laughs> Let's let's not go there because that that's that's all that's all falling apart now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Anything that came out of that. Um, okay, well th that was my um, uh, not diatribe, but um, interesting point of the day. Are uh, you guys got anything? Mm. No. How was the um, the the uh, pip? Uh, LSPA meeting received. Thought it was. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I I wasn't there. So I don't know. I when I when I shut off this computer at night, <laughs> uh, I I tried to divorce. I, I have to divorce myself from work as much as possible. Uh, it's just too close. <laughs> One, one of the points that was brought up was that the PIP guidance was 1991. Yep. Yeah, and, it and it references like waiver sites. Yeah. Is, is it on anybody's list to update it, that? It is. It is. Um, uh, Liz and um, I think Nancy Fitzpatrick and uh, Peggy Shaw and probably others are, yeah. are, are working on that as well. And it's Part, part of the effort that we have to bring back the technical assistance grants, which looks like we'll be able to um, you know, have them ready to go to actually start awarding them in uh, the next fiscal year. So in the spring, we'll be looking to um, kind of put out the grant proposals and start soliciting it so we can actually grant, you know, give out the money you know, when we get the next pot of money in, in our next budget. The and and so that's kind of looking at the PIP guidance goes along with that, and there's been, obviously been a lot of changes. I would yeah. hope that some of the changes are going to involve uh, being able to use emails and not have to still deal with certified letters or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and and some of the the changes in the you know, most recent MCP regs, which are also are making progress, uh, you know, get to that as well. You know, I think that the the um, COVID Q and A that came out was helpful, and the and the few sites that we've had pips mm -hmm. during this, I think, have been pretty successful with the the online. So, yep. You know, we're, I think the, we're, we're we're we've got a good experience base in the past few years. I think in doing this. Yep. Whereas in 1991, it was pretty new. <laughs> Yeah, so well, well, well time to, to update it. And as we were talking about at the beginning of this discussion of the, these tools that we're now using, like Zoom, um, you know, have really improved it. We were, um, I was helping out on, there was a, I don't know if I talked about this before, but another interesting way of kind of organizing all of these for, for larger audiences, the, um, working with on an appeal. So I wasn't involved in the appeal. I was just involved in the uh, video technical assistance. Uh, but there was a, a hearing uh, hearing being held uh, on an appeal of something uh, for a site that you know, has periodically been in the news. And so they wanted to set it up so that the public could view it, uh, but not, you know, it, the appeals, the public has no role in the actual you know, managing and conducting the appeal, but they wanted to have an audience. So uh, apparently one of the cool things that Zoom will allow you to do very, very easily is to broadcast it live on YouTube. 
Really? The audience, so you could have a limited group, say, you know, one way of setting this up, we could have, you know, our Wayside Cleanup Advisory Committee, for example, be, you know, the, you know, 12 or so members of that plus DEP staff be doing it in Zoom and, and be able to talk freely and, you know, everybody would be, have the ability to mute and unmute themselves, et cetera. And we would interrupt each other all the time like they usually do, but that's fine because that's the advisory committee. And then the audience could be uh, watching on a live YouTube stream and they could see what's going on real time, but they would, you know, they wouldn't be able to interrupt, you know, and we wouldn't have to worry about them uh, in Zoom. We, uh, if they would watch and, it was an interesting way and you know, very easy to set up and, and a great way of, um, of holding bigger meetings where you don't have necessarily audience participation. Now, our advisory committee, we always have, <coughs> we always have audience participation. Did you spill your coffee? <laughs> no, no, I, I was playing with these, these metal coasters, which are, are actually race metals, but they use the, made them as metal coasters and it's just a ner nervous habit of like playing with things. Um, and it got out of hand, literally. Um, our advisory committee, we would want you know, the interaction and the interruptions, but you can see where you know, it, it would be a very easy way of conducting you know, some larger public meetings like that. Mm. So all sorts of cool toys, uh, tools that we have available that hopefully we'll be able to uh, increase the range of public participation. Um, and in, as we mentioned last week, I think, and in, in before, we have this new uh, public involvement, uh, environmental justice guidance uh, for, for DEP staff on how to kind of increase the effectiveness of public involvement when we do it. Some of that will be incorporated into the revised Waste site cleanup, public involvement, uh, just you know, talking about ways of, of kind of expanding, making sure you you uh, do appropriate outreach and make contacts. Uh, we're doing dealing with translation services a lot. Uh, we've had cases where we've, we've had live translations on Zoom that has been very effective, uh, and just you know, a lot of things that we can do now that you know we would never have dreamed of doing in 1993. Uh, and and even now, uh, just a couple of years ago. So, uh, Carol, I, it was the last meeting. Carol Boyce was talking about it was the gentleman that got the environmental justice award. And um, one of the issues they were dealing, yeah, that was part of the same meeting, um, was they did a lot of work in a part of Framingham where they needed translations, and they were um, they had. I guess translations for some of these public meetings, so there was a way to do it. Yeah. Um. Yep. So we have, um, you know, in at DEP, there are a bunch of different options for your know, documents that we need translated. Uh, there are a couple ways of going about it. Uh, we have a translation bank, so we we certainly have staff who are bilingual, and they will uh, they've self-identified and volunteered to help with translation services as needed. And often that means um, making a good first cut and then sending it out to our professional service for, for tweaking. Because as you've, you've probably have run into, um, the translating highly technical and or highly regulatory information uh, is, um, is not very easy. <laughs> Uh, not even most translation services here, you know, they, they're great at translating, but when you get into the, mean, the subtle meanings of some of these words, it's good to have many, many eyes on them, uh, including back and forth with uh, native speakers here at DEP that know both sides of things. And we talked with you know, people here uh, who are bilingual, but they're, and the, the you know, in English, they, they often you know, use the regulatory and technical terms in English, and, but their uh, second or, or maybe sometimes even first language uh, is more conversational or, and, and they don't usually have the opportunity to use your know, regulatory and technical terms 
uh, so that you know, it's it's even difficult uh, having DEP staff or bilingual. You know, the, there are companies that provide translational services. My son used to work for one called TransPerfect. It's a it's a global company, and the, their sort of market was in um, uh, biotech research hmm. because a lot of that is done all over the world. And so it has to be translated, I guess, you know, for, for U.S. use. And it's not just word for word, but it's the local, I guess, customs or whatever. There's, yep. there's, there's more that goes into the translations and verbatim. Yep. Um, and apparently he's very sick. He's not there anymore, but the company's called TransPerfect. They, they had an office in Boston. And that's, they have software that does these translations and people. Yeah, we, we do our, our language bank, the, you know, we, like I said, we do an in, internal first cut and then send it out for, for polishing to professional translating services. Wayside cleanup, uh, because we have uh, bond money that can be used for, for that sort of thing. We also have access to that um, to go there directly. Uh, so yeah, it, it is, it, it's something that you, you need our kind of professional people who are trained in this kind of translation. It's not simply word for word. And you know, relying, yeah. relying on Google to translate is one thing. You know. um, but it, and it will get you, you know, maybe one step in that direction, uh, relying on, on people that are bilingual, but are not trained in translation uh, is, is certainly a step in the right direction. But uh, I would just caution everybody that you know, to do it right and make sure that the message is uh, appropriately translated with the the nuances that go go into it that we often well I'd say we often don't think about it when speaking in our native language uh, but even then you know as as a regulator I have to stop and think about exactly what this language means and the nuances and if it's hard that hard to do in in my native language where the regulations are actually written uh, you know it's you're doubly important to make sure that when they're translated, that the translation captures those nuances and subtleties as well. And that's so, you know, flag for everybody that it's a something that are uh, hiring you know, or or ready to buy your cousin who took three years of French, you know, in high school doesn't cut it for this. It's like trying to translate Boston English into another language. You got to take all the R's out. Yeah, which, which I know from experience. When, when I was in the Peace Corps, I, I taught chemistry and physics in French and with my, my accent. And uh, interesting. It, it, but interesting, not pretty, but interesting. Well, it's a lot of the idioms too that uh, you know, get messed up. Yeah. Yes, which, okay, we're, we're kind of falling off the environmental topic here, but th this is one thing that comes up in talking about translation in the uh, French English stuff. So we would all in our French classes and uh, local language classes, one of the things that we would translate would be, uh, would, would be um, proverbs and things like that. Uh, and kind of interesting thing, the, the statement, uh, a rolling stone gathers no moss. You're familiar with that, right? Yes. Sure. Okay. Is it a good thing or a bad thing to have moss? <laughs> yes. Good question. It depends. So, as an as an American, I've always interpreted that as, uh, you know, being moss free is good. You know, you want to be a rolling stone. You you, yeah. you want to be free of all of that greenery and stuff weighing you down you want to you want to move right. uh when that came up with my uh french teacher in in the peace corps in africa uh she was insistent that you know being being covered with moss you know, is a good thing that you want you don't want to be a rolling stone you want to have stability you want to be rooted in your community you want moss you want to be supportive of, of other things growing. And you know, there was the first time, I mean, that, maybe not the first time, but it's clearly you know, stuck in my memory of 
kind of, it's hard to put yourself in other people's places and to, to, to have other perspectives. And that's you know, what travel is good for and what uh, you know, living in other communities is good for because you know, uh, it, it helps you kind of see things from other people's perspectives. And I, never, I would have never come to the conclusion that moss is good <laughs> on my own. It's like a walk on the slippery rocks. Hi. Right. So any 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 other things you guys want to bring up? You're all doing well, keeping busy. Everybody's healthy. Okay. Uh, I just want to, since Randy is here, I want to pass along one thing that Randy, I confirmed again yesterday that you are still our number one priority for getting a laptop. Silence. <laughs> She's tired. What of, is she using now? Uh, an, an old laptop. This is okay. old laptop. Um, we, we are in the process of a massive computer buy and rollout that is not the easiest thing to do uh, to get everybody laptops that at the appropriate. Um, they keep getting smaller. Yes. With well, fewer connections. I, I like I, I would rather carry around something heavier with with bigger things and lots of connections. But is anyone I, else is anyone else having to do the double authentic authentication? Um, you know, I, I think I told yeah. you several months ago our system was hacked and we you know we got the ransomware and since then it's crazy. We gotta have like a uh, 20 character password that gets updated every six months or so. And uh, when I go to hook onto our sonic wall, I then get a, a text, an email back that says, put in this number, I gotta then put in the number. That's after putting in that 20 character password. Oh yeah. And we have a program. We used to have that, the double, and then there's a program because you have so many different applications. Yep. And so this application comes up, I don't know the name of it, you know, the IT guys put it in and it's a facial recognition. Really? Yeah. That would be so great. If I can find the name of it, I'll email it to you. But it's a, mm -hmm. it's a program that took the place of all that. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I'm actually just getting used. So until last week, I had an iPhone 5. <laughs> oh my, was it a, almost a flip phone? Uh, yeah, and... Uh, I, I like the life proof case, but they know and it broke. So they no longer make a replacement. You know, usually they would give you a free life proof case if it wore out. Yeah. Uh, so I got an iPhone 12 mini, which ironically is no bigger than my <laughs> iPhone 5. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's literally, I mean, it, it may be a little bit bigger, but, you know, not not much. So I, I'm ordering a life proof case for, for this. They do make life proof cases for this one. Um, but mm. uh I got the XR two years ago. It's already two generations too old, but I, I can't even figure out this one. So the thing I liked about the five was that it goes in my seat pack on my bicycle very easily. Those bigger ones, you know, my friends are carrying them in the pockets on their shirt, and yeah. I'm always afraid that it's gonna, you know, fall out. The case makes it bigger too. But, yeah. Yeah. but the newer ones, the glass is much more durable. Yeah. I've yeah. dropped it and um, I have an otter box case. Yeah. Um, and it's it's surprisingly survived so far. Yeah, but it is a little bigger. Otterbox and uh, Lifeproof are essentially the same company now. But you know, it does make it thicker. Yeah. It's a, a regulatory guidance issue. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a I have a Pixel two, uh, which has been. Yeah. You know, the the great thing about it. Uh, when Google updates the pixels and software, they, they roll everything back or send it back to the earlier version. So you know, if every year when they update you know, the software, the operating system, and you know, they'll update the camera. So it's, it's taking better pictures now than it did you know, four years ago when I got it. Hmm. That's what blew me away. The camera on this thing is unbelievable. I know. I haven't used my SLR in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you used to you used to take a lot of photographs, Elliot. 
Yeah, I still do, but it's yeah, well. The let me the it will still as nice as they are. They don't you know, until they put on really nice telephoto lenses on it. Uh, you know we're it's not going to replace it. So the this was from the other night. Did you get the conjoining or whatever the the convergence? Oh, you did. Yeah, uh, so you could see it. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, so, I saw it. I they were much closer together when I saw it. Well, that was close together. That was an eight hundred millimeter lens, but uh, yeah, that was Tuesday night. Tuesday night. Not yeah, it, a misty peak. At like six fifteen. Yeah, I, no, I see. We had a break in the clouds around six fifteen, which yeah. was supposedly the peak, and that's that's when I saw it. It was pretty cool. Yeah, on Monday when it was. Yeah, suppose the, the closest that it was, you know, it was overcast all day, and I'm here in the basement, and so I'm thinking, oh, it's overcast, I'm not even going to try, and and then I go out and hear that, oh yeah, oh the clouds broke, just in time. Oh well, but yeah, I have my my SLRs that you know, I I will not give up. But the I used to carry around um, a little went back when we were all using film, a small pocket 35 millimeter you know film camera um, just have a camera with me at all times so it's you know the, the even the pixel 2 you know several generations out of date uh is just so nice to have around is uh, to always have a camera ready but oh well when uh, i go out in the field i still bring out i have a little kodak no kodak um Canon, a Canon. Oh, it's a Canon. You know, it was back just before cameras became good. So it's really small, takes really nice pictures. You know, it goes on a, a CD, card, a little card. Mm -hmm. Because the thing with Apple, they, if you're not using another Apple device, they come in upside down. It's very annoying. <laughs> really? Right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So if I, uh, if I load these, download these from my Apple to my, you know, uh, PC-based work computer, they come in upside down. I think it's just a little dig it, that Apple does to you if you're not using all Apple devices. Just make sure that you're you're using. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, our almost ten o'clock. Our any. Anything else? Or we can let you go off. I'm going to start. I'm going to stop stop Thank babbling. You. Have a happy holiday, everyone. Yeah, you too, yep. everybody. Same to you. Uh, was Elliot on the on the Zoom when we uh, talked about the next meeting dates? I'm not sure he was. No, uh, I was not. not. Uh, so Elliot, we're yeah. I think you came in right at the tail end of that. Uh, on January seventh, we're taking next week off. January seventh, we're off because that coincides with the EBC program that has DEP senior staff on it. So Thursday the 7th, I will be joining our Commissioner Suberg and all of the other assistant commissioners, uh, Ben Erickson, general counsel, and others uh, on an EBC call. Uh, so we'll be starting this back up on January 14th. Thank you. Is that EBC uh, open to the public or is that an internal meeting? Oh, well, it's open to the public. You know, it's an EBC event. An EBC event. What's the topic? Uh, it's you know DEP senior staff program. Like, it's an program update. Yeah, we we do it every January with EBC. Okay. The last like I look for three, four years. You know, use last few years it's always been at CDM downtown. They usually provide little. Things of yogurt, pastry, coffee, juice. I'm They're virtual now. I mean, that's really the reason I do these things. But, uh, but uh, so that's what we'll be. Um, and uh, so see you on the 14th. And you know, meanwhile, send in any questions. You know, either to to me or bwc.information at mass.gov. Um, and think of. More updates and have a good New Year's too.
Be wild. Thank you. Same, same to all. Happy Stay New well. Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Bye -bye. Merry Christmas.